Yeah, so, so let's start. Um, today we're very happy to have um, Heidi Poxon from Cray with us today for the uh, training. Heidi is the, he, she is the Performance Tools te Technical Lead and Manager of the Performance Tools and Application Modeling Groups in Cray. Um, she has 25 years of experience in HPC. She has worked on many areas such as um, shared memory, parallelism, interconnect, and distributed computing technology and parallel processing performance tools. Heidi has participated in the design and development of several MPI implementations, um, Cray's auto tasking software, Cray Pack Performance Collector, Cray Apprentice 2 Performance Analyzer, and Reveal, which are all focused on improving application developers' um, parallelization, tuning, and performance experience. So today she's going to tell us about how to use the Cray Review tool to help holding application to many core architectures um, by adding OpenMT to your program based on Cray path performance analysis and Cray compiler scoping and vectorization feedback analysis. Um, so I forgot to tell you, my name is Helen He. I'm a nurse consultant and user services group. Um, so Heidi, um, it's all yours now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, talk to you about a little bit first about why Cray decided to develop a tool like Reveal and what its purpose was and, and really what we believe is important on our current systems and going forward on our future systems as far as extracting performance out of the, the multi-node systems. And then we'll talk about how to use the software, uh, go through the different features and capability of this particular tool. And um, I can answer any questions that you have. We'll talk about what's running on Edison, because uh, I did go and take a look at, at the version of Reveal that's, that's running on Edison. And then, um, again, you can, I'm not sure how the questions will be presented here at this, but if you do have questions during the talk, that's fine. Otherwise, we can do them at the end. Either way, either way is fine. Yeah, so questions, if you are on WebEx, you can type into the chat room and, and direct question to the host instead of the presenter. And if you're the audio bridge, um, you can just talk into the phone. And I like, I'll ask Heidi to, to let us know her preference and interrupt your talk or you want to ask question at the end. Yeah, I'm fine if, if, if you interrupt me during the talk, if you'd like, that's totally fine. Um, I, if, if you do type questions in, maybe Helen, you can help me see them. I'm not sure if I'll see them when I have the presentation mode going on my laptop. So, so if there is a question and I don't see it for some reason, then just give me a holler here. Uh, you probably don't see the question directly, but um, Richard here will guide you the questions we, we receive from the, the chat room okay. in the web app. All right. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Thank you. okay so, so to get started, um, so the future architecture directions that we see going forward here is that really the nodes on a system that we're delivering in the HPC industry are becoming more uh, parallel and um, they have more depth of parallelism to them. They have more processors, uh, more threads, the vector lengths are getting longer. So basically the nodes are becoming more capable. They're becoming stronger entities in them themselves. Um, as we go forward, we see a, a common programming style that we expect to continue uh, for the foreseeable future, and that is where you use message passing or MPI um, definitely between nodes. What we do see is we do see people reducing the number of MPI ranks within a node so that they can add additional levels of parallelism within the node, but we do see MPI as a big player going forward in the programming model use. And then we're seeing a rise in multi-threading within a node like OpenMP within, within your MPI rank. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is, but basically um, what, what we're seeing is that as you scale your job to larger and larger sizes, the MPI uh, programming model or programming language starts leveling off. So now you also have with the recent processors vectorization capability through SSC, AVX, um, we have vectorization capabilities through our GPU accelerators uh, and now through Intel Phi. So that's something that's becoming more popular too. So moving on to the next slide on the slide four, the future application direction that we see because of this architectural direction is that threading is 
threading both and vectorization are more <coughs> important. Because the node is so capable, we are finding that a single level of parallelism like MPI is not able to exploit all the capacity of the system or the capability of the node. So we've done some polls with our different customers and what, what we see. I'm also not getting audio. I called to the Skype. Is there, is there a question? So you, then you get audio. Uh, hello? Yeah, we, we didn't get audio to the WebEx, so we called to the Skype. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can hear you. Um, so... Uh, should, should, I, should I move my microphone? Because I'm following fine. Yeah, I have actually a question to ask. We can hear you fine. Okay, um, I'll move my crap microphone. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing fine, okay? So I won't bother you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, what we've seen when we've looked at applications that are running our, on our system is that most of the applications, um, approximately 80% of the applications are using purely MPI. We have seen some, uh, some people use the PGAS programming model, which is the Coray Fortran or UPC programming models, but that's similar to MPI where it's a distributed model. But most of the people are using a single level of parallelism. A few applications have started using OpenMP, some, some are, but that's not the majority. And we are seeing that this is something that needs to happen. And so Cray took a look at this and um, tried to come up with something to be able to help users that, where they could continue to use the programming model the, that they're familiar with, the MPI programming model, take another existing programming model like OpenMP and add that. So we didn't want to drastically change and introduce brand new programming models, if possible, because we know that that takes a long time to adopt and a lot of people have legacy codes that already have certain levels of parallelism and are using certain programming models. So we wanted a solution where they could continue to use MPI, they would add shared memory uh, little by little to their program, hopefully, or completely restructure it to add MP, uh, OpenMP and then add vectorization all with existing models. So a few things, how do you know when you have an application that currently uses just MPI and you want to know if you can take advantage of additional parallelism with OpenMP? And one of the things that we typically say is when your MPI is starts leveling off or it's no longer scaling as you're increasing your job size, it's time to start looking at deeper levels of parallelism. Or if you want to run in an environment where you're running on both, for example, an x86 and an accelerated node, you're going to have to add additional levels of parallelism there, too. So some things to look for is if your code is network bound, for example. Um, a couple of things, if, if any of you are familiar with the Cray performance tools, such as CrayPat, uh, one of the things that you can look at uh, are collective times, if you're using MPI collective routines. Uh, if you see synchronization going up, uh, that may be network, an indication of network contention or contention to get onto the network. Um, you can look at your point-to-point -point wait time. So basically, if you start to see your MPI ranks, excuse me, your MPI rank um, the starting to stall out, not being able to get onto the network. Um, and the other thing, too, is if you have shared resources on your node, if you have contention of shared resources, for example, as we increase the core count on our nodes, let's say you have 24 cores running on a node and they all want to talk off node, there is going to be a bottleneck to get off node onto the network. And so as you start seeing that type of contention, or maybe you're seeing memory, you have a memory bound code and you're seeing contention there, there's some ways where you can balance things a little differently and add more levels of parallelism. So what Cray has done is we've developed a series of steps to help users um, add additional levels of parallelization to their code. The first thing that you need to do is decide where to, to tackle your application. So you want to identify your key high-level loops. So when we're, when we're saying you, we want you to add OpenMP to a program, we're not asking you to add small loops or you know, open MP to the small looping structures. What we're looking for really is the high level looping structures, the ones that are just below the time step of your loop or of, of your application. 
so that there's plenty of work. And to do that, typically the application or those loops have a lot of calls to routines, and so that can be difficult. So we have some things to help you with Cray software to help you identify these top loops. So after you figure out which loops you want to look at, um, then you need to perform your parallel analysis. And you, so you need to identify if there are any dependencies within those loops, and you need to track and analyze all the variables in those loops so that you can scope them as shared or private to build your directive. And then you need to understand what can be vectorized and what can't. And so the parallel analysis is, uh, is an important step before you can actually start adding any OpenMP directives. One of the things when we talk about adding GPUs, for example, and trying to use GPUs on a system, and we talk about CUDA, uh, some sometimes what happens is people talk about how to add the CUDA, but they don't actually talk about, well, how do you deal with the dependencies and create a parallel segment of code that you can therefore then offload. And so that's an important step. The next thing is to add the OpenMP directives and to go ahead and, and after you've scoped and analyzed everything to make sure it's parallel, to go in and insert the directives. And this can also be um, a time-consuming task if you're going to parallelize an outer loop, a uh, high-level loop, because there are a lot of variables involved. So, And then finally, you can analyze, after you've added this, this second level of parallelism, you can analyze for lower levels of vectorization. And we'll talk about some things that we do within the tool to help you with these different areas. One of the difficulties in um, doing this work is trying to figure out which loop is, uh, is a loop to go after to try and parallelize. Sometimes you have to have several parallel loops, several, and actually I mentioned GPUs here again, but whether you're running on an x86 system or a PHY system in offload mode, you need to have plenty of work for your OpenMP. Um, and it, it can be difficult and a daunting task if you don't have any assistance, or it can be error prone. And so we'll talk to you about a little bit about what, what we've found here as we've tried to look at this ourselves. So understanding what is a good loop to parallelize, so you don't go through your application and just pick the first loop in the first file you look at, because we don't want you to waste your time. We want to make sure there's enough work to warrant parallelizing loops. Um, also, what prevents you from parallelizing the loop? So when you go through and you choose a loop, are there dependencies or issues that you need to work around in order to parallelize the loop? And then, and then how can you get help building a directive if there are a lot of components to building that directive? So I have an example here that is a from a program called VH1. It's from an astrophysics code. This is a routine sweep Z. And there's an outer loop, a do day loop. And inside you can see that there's another couple of loops and there's a couple of calls to functions. And inside the call to PPMLR within that loop, there are a bunch of other calls to other functions. And those functions call other functions. So if I want to parallelize this do J loop, uh, I have to go through everything within that outer visible loop, but I also have to follow all those variables, including global variables, through that call chain. So that can be a daunting, daunting task. And so Cray developed a tool that will help you with that. It will help you look at something like a DoJ loop and assess it for parallelizing and help identify where there are issues. Um, we can also, one of the things that we've done is we've taken the compiler information that's already there, it's already available to you today, but it's available in several different places, and we've combined it all into one place, into one uh, tool so that you can view things a little more easily. We'll walk through a little bit uh, about all the different things that the tool can do. So first off, uh, the tool can be used in two different ways. One way is it can be used to browse what the compiler decided to do with your program after you compiled it. So you don't actually have to run your application. You can just compile it and use reveal to look at the optimizations that the compiler performed on your code. That's the first thing that you can do. The second thing that you can do is you can run your application and collect loop work estimates to try and identify which loops are key candidates to try and parallelize. So which loops are worth your time to try and parallelize. 
So first we'll talk a little bit about that and how you can create these loop statistics and feed those into Reveal. So the things that we want out of a loop, um, there's been a lot of research that's been done on how you characterize a loop that you maybe want to uh, parallelize or that you want to optimize in some way. And the thing that we found is good enough to collect is basically time information. And what we do is we collect inclusive time. So inclusive time is the time that it takes that loop to execute, including all the time it took it, any routines that were called within that loop to execute. So what we do is we collect min, max, and average trip counts, and we collect this inclusive time for the loop. And then we also collect the number of times that loop was executed within the application. And all that information can be used by the user then to determine which loops are the best candidates. If a loop is has a large number of trip counts, but it's only executed once, maybe in the initialization code, it might not be as good a candidate as a loop that's executed a thousand times or a hundred times and has a lot of work, for example. So bringing that information and making it available to the user is helpful. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about how to collect that information. Uh, this is something that's available through the Cray programming environment. You do need the Cray compiler for this, and you do need the Cray performance tools for this. So what you would do is you would load, or on Edison, by default, the Intel programming environment is, is loaded when you log in to the system, and so you would have to do a swap to PRGENV Cray when you, so you do a module swap to that on Edison. Then you load the PerfTools module, which is not loaded by default um, when you log into the system. And then you need to compile and link with a special flag, which is called Profile Generate. And what this does is this generates a basic loop profile for your application. So once you've compiled your code for this, you want to instrument it with the CrayPat um, tools. So the basic instrumentation, which is the lowest overhead and most effective for this experiment, is to just add a minus W option to pass build. And what that will do is that will turn tracing on, and we will collect statistics for loop based on the, the compiled flag that you, that you built with. And then you run your application and process your report. And so so this is how you would do this. Um, actually, I'm getting an echo all of a sudden. I don't know if somebody's phone changed or... Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, we just heard echo too. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's gone now. Yeah. So maybe somebody wasn't on mute. Okay. All right, so, so then after you run your application, you run PAT report, and what you're going to get is an AP2 file. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, um, CrayPat, you could just follow these steps, um, hopefully, and be able to generate uh, a report and an AP2 file. The AP2 file that you see as a result of running PAT report is what you're going to feed into Reveal as the loop statistics. So this is an example if you want to look at the report that's generated by PAT report and by using CrayPat with this experiment. And so what you can see here in the second table in the report is a list of all the loops in the program, um, not all of them, but the, the top time-consuming loops in your program, and they're sorted by inclusive time. So remember I said we're going after inclusive time, so if there's any calls within that loop, we're adding that time in as well, that execution time. You can also see that you have your hit rate, so how many times your loop was encountered during the execution of your program and your average min and max trip counts for the loop. On the right-hand side of this table, you can see sweep y at the top, and that's the function name, so that's the function where this loop lives. And then at the very end of that, that label, you'll see li.33, and that means line number 33. So in sweep y, in sweep y at line 33, there's a loop that took almost nine seconds. This isn't a very large executing application example here, but it took almost nine seconds to execute, and it had it was encountered a hundred times, and you can see the the trip count of 25. You also notice the first two entries. There's one at line 33 and one at 34. So you can tell those are nested loops. 
by the line numbers most likely and you can also tell by the hit count, the hit rate because um, the inner loop was hit 2,500 times versus the 100 times and your trip count was 25. So you can do that math and see that those are, are nested loops. So you have this experiment and the experiment that to get the loop statistics are, is a completely separate experiment from Reveal. As I said, you can use Reveal without running your application. You can use it just to view optimization. But if you're going to add OpenMP, we suggest you do that first experiment first. So you get your AP2 file from CrayPat, and then you're going to run Reveal and look at the performance statistics as well as the compiler optimization. So how do you use Reveal? So one of the things that we require, in addition to the Cray compiler, is that you build a program library. And a program library is basically a database of information about your application. What it does is it allows the compiler to see the application as a whole, as opposed to just one compilation unit at a time. At a time. And, and what that allows it to do separately from running reveal is it can do more advanced inlining, for example, because it can see all the files and knows where all the files are, it can do more aggressive inlining. So one of the things that we have as a flag that I did not include here is a minus, or yes, I did include it, sorry, is the minus HWP for whole program analysis. That's an optional flag for reveal. It's not needed for reveal, but what that does is it shows you an example of by default, we don't do this, but if you ask for whole program analysis, you'll get more aggressive inlining and, and different optimizations or potentially more aggressive optimization. Sometimes it takes a long time, a longer time to build your code. It really depends on your program, and so we didn't enable this by default for every application. So the way you create a program library is to use a minus HPL flag, and then you specify the name of a directory that you want. If you have an application that has source files in multiple directories. You only want one program library. So this example, actually, I should update. It's not very good because it doesn't show the path. So you should specify a path to your program library. Uh, this, this, in this example, all my source files live in one directory, and so I just specified the directory name. But if they're in multiple if, and you don't specify the full path, you'll get a program library for each directory, each subdirectory, and then it won't understand. The compiler won't do the right thing. So a full path should be is recommended. Is there a question? Is there a question? Is there a question or is that just um, mute, please? Okay, so after you create the program library, then you want you can launch Reveal. Again, Reveal is part of the Cray Performance Tools package, and so you have to load the Perf Tools module for that. And uh, that's like you did with CrayPad to collect your loop statistics. So once you've loaded the Perf Tools module, then you can launch Reveal two ways, as I suggested before. Uh, you can do it either just with compiling your code, in that case you only specify the program library, or you can add the AP2 file with the performance statistics. So you launch it by saying Reveal, and then Program Library, and then Performance Statistics. You can also add the statistics later, and I'll show you as we walk through use of the tool, um, I'll show you how that, that happens. So now the next set of slides that I have here are to show you the capability that's available through the tool, and then uh, some, the last set as we add directives will actually walk you through adding the directives. Since running a GUI over WebEx isn't quite as good, I tried to work the slides so that it would be what the, the exact steps the user would do to go through to, to um, scope variables and add a directive. So when first when the tool first comes up, what I've done in this first example is I just specified a program library. I didn't specify the performance data. And what you see here on the left-hand side is your navigation panel, and this is where your source files are listed or your loops are listed. Um, and in this case, these are files. And then uh, we tried to integrate help within the tool. So if you click on help or if you're if you click on the getting started here when you bring up the tool, it'll bring up some basic information about the tool. 
When you click on a file and a loop, in this example here, I do have some performance information added already, but you can see in the main window, there's source code, and in that source code, you have um, some loop mark, which we'll talk about in a minute here. One of the things I wanted to call out that's available is for a specific loop that I'm viewing, you can see on the left-hand side I've clicked on loop at 33, so loop at line 33 in this file. And at the top of the source panel, you can see I'm in sweep x2.f90. So I'm pointing to that loop, and now I have the optimization messages from our compiler for that loop right at the bottom in the info pane there of the tool. If I right-click on one of those compiler messages, it will bring up another window with the explain capability. So the Cray compiler has explain capability, and normally when you see a message from your listing or your loop mark information, you type explain in the message number. So this is the exact same information. All you're doing is you're right-clicking on that message, and it'll automatically find that, that explanation for that message for you. One of the things that we can do, by default we bring up files, but one of the things we can do is we can navigate by files, we can navigate by loops, but we can also navigate by compiler messages. So if today, for example, I want to take a look at my application and find all the loops that didn't vectorize, because I'm going to focus on vectorization for the day, then I can go in and I can just display the loops in my program that didn't vectorize and, and look at the compiler messages for those loops. We also support other message categories too, like functions that didn't inline or loops that did vectorize, if you want to look at what did vectorize and see what percentage vectorized, that sort of thing. So it's just a different way of, of taking a look at what the compiler did to your code. Another thing that we show with your program is if we inlined a function and within a loop, what you'll see is if you click on that function, if you go to that function in your source and browse through that, um, you'll see a little caret next to it. And that caret will, uh, you can expand that. And what we will show you is pseudocode for that function that was inlined. So that if you are looking at a loop that you want to optimize and there's a bunch of calls that got inlined, you can actually expand those calls and get an understanding of the flow of that loop without having to jump to those different routines to look at the code. So it's not exact, it's not your source code, it's decompiled code basically from the compiler's perspective, but it's what the compiler viewed that inline routine to mean in that, in that loop, for example. And you can easily search to different things. You can use Control F to search to different things within files and within the tool. So let me go back here for one quick thing I did want to mention. The other thing here, too, is when you're looking at your source code in the main window, you can see that there's loop mark information on the left-hand side. Uh, in this panel here, there's an I, V, and a W, and then down below towards the call to grid, you see an A, I, V, F, R, 4. Those are all the loop marks. Is there a question? What slide number are you looking at? So I'm looking at slide 18. Okay, thank you. Yep. And the loop mark information that's there is available already in the compiler if you generate a listing file with loop mark information. Uh, typically, there's a legend at the top of the text file. And so as you're scrolling through, as you're looking through your different loops, you have to remember what the different symbols mean from the compiler. Um, here, those, those symbols are there for each loop and you can just hover over the symbols and we'll tell you what they mean. Um, so in this case, for example, um, there's things in here about the loop, there's, there's um, unrolling by four, there's vectorization going on, and you can see that basic, basically from the compiler messages as well. But we show you the loop mark information, which is a shorthand description of what the compiler did, and then you can look at the compiler messages as well. So if I go to slide 19, now what I'm going to do here is kind of walk through. I'm going to attach some performance data. And the way you do that, if you didn't start reveal, if you started reveal just with a program library and you didn't already add the AP2 file, you can go find your AP2 file for your program. Um, you can go to the file menu up at the top, and there's an attach performance data uh, menu item there, and that's how you can add your AP2 file. 
So when you do add your AP2 file, what do you see? So on the left-hand side now, you've got loops that you navigate by. You no longer navigate by files and functions. So, and the loops are, are sorted by inclusive time. So your top time-consuming loops are at the top of the list. Um, as you see here in this example slide, I have a sweep Y at 35, which is at the top of the slide. So that's um, function sweep Y at line 35. There's a loop that took four seconds to execute. The little carrots that are to the that are alongside the loop information in that panel. If you expand that, what that shows you are all the instances of that loop in the program. So. For every time, every time that loop is called, whether it's from the same place or from different places within the program, we track that for you. So you can click on, if you expand it, you can click on the individual instances of that loop. Once you do click on an instance of that loop, so here in this slide we have Ryman at line 63 and we've clicked on PPMLR at 73. Once, um, actually, this is a little bit of an outdated slide. I think now instead of saying PPMLR, it'll just say instance one, instance two, because um, it's not as intuitive as for what the PPMLR means. But if you click on it, down below you'll see there's a traceback panel at the very bottom there, and that tells you how you got to that loop from main. So from top down, so it turns out that. Um, Ryman, the loop in Ryman was, was um, you, we got to that loop by the call to PPMLR and we got to the PPMLR call by a loop in sweep Y at line 67 or line um, 36 and line 67 and then we have the sweep Y was called from Behone which is the main, main program or the, which was main in this application. So there's a trace back of where that loop came from. So basically as you're trying to understand which loops to parallelize, it gives you a feel for where they where those loops live within your application. So now I have my performance statistics in the in the tool and I want to try and parallelize some loops. So one way to do this is you can always right click on an individual loop and scope the variables for that loop. But I want to show you a, a recipe that we've been using that's turned out to be quite useful if you don't know very much about, uh, it, it, it's kind of a bulk process to be able to do it a little more quickly. So if you go to view at the top, there's a scoping tool menu item. And that's what brings up the scoping tool part of reveal. So when I first bring up the scoping tool, I get another window. So I'm just showing that window here. And one of the things that you can do is blank if you haven't right clicked on anything, if you haven't already added any loops to parallelize or to, to analyze. So there's an edit button there, and this is new. This is something that's new since we've released Reveal, but you should have this on Edison. Um, if you click on edit list, one of the menu items is, is add all loops. So I'm going to take all loops as possible candidates to try and parallelize. That's the first thing I'm going to do. The next thing I'm going to do is I want to expand all loops because what I see when I say add all loops is I get all my files listed here and everything is checked off to say analyze it for parallelism but I want to see what's going on a little more so I'm going to expand them. So one of the things that you, if you were to do this and just analyze all loops within your program within Reveal, it's going to take a long time to execute. Uh, because it's going to look at every loop and every nested loop uh, for parallel analysis. So what I want to do is I actually want to apply a filter. And um, so on 24, on slide 24, the, at the bottom here you can see there's an apply filter button. And I've added 0.8 seconds to that. And the way I did that, if I can jump up again quickly here, I think, um, I don't know if it's showing it perfectly here. Yeah, this doesn't match well. The way I got it is I looked at my loop statistics that I had in the navigation panel when I brought up the loop statistics. And I chose a threshold that I want to look at only loops within that are above a certain amount of time that took more than 0.8 seconds in this case. I can also set trips. So if I say I only want to look at loops that took more than 100 trip counts, that had more than 100 iterations, I can do that. So what that did is once I applied that filter, now I'm down to only 10 loops that I selected to try and parallelize, which won't take as long to, to analyze, and it's going to be the loops that are the most important. So 
remember, so what I did is I went into edit list. I said I want to look at all loops. I, get, I want to bring them all into the scoping part of the tool, but then I want to apply a filter so that I'm only looking at the top loops. Okay? That's just a quicker way to, to grab the top loops for analysis. And that's worked quite well for us. So you can see the results of this analysis. Um, so now I have loops that, yeah, the eight seconds, the point eight seconds does fit because I went for everything above uh, Ryman on the left hand side. There's, you can see on slide 25, I have a bunch of red dots and a, one green dot. So this particular application is the same one I showed you before where there's the, the do J loop with the call to PPMLR and it had a bunch of calls to functions. And it's actually no surprise that it wasn't clean and found a bunch of loops that could, you could automatically parallelize. So the green square on the left hand side for Ryman at line, at line 63 means that loop is parallelizable. I could go ahead and add an OpenMP directive in front of that loop and it would execute correctly. That's what it's supposed to mean. If it doesn't do that for some reason, that's a bug on Cray's part. Okay, so if we say something is good to go to parallelize, it should execute correctly. If it's not okay to parallelize as is, we add the red dot. So now there's a bunch of red dots you can see, and actually the very top one is most likely the time step loop, which we don't want to parallelize anyway. So we're going to start looking at the loops below that. Again, this slide says that you can also, if you want to individually parallelize a loop, or if you don't want to use this bulk method where you bring all the loops in and apply a filter, you can right click on select loops and add them to that scoping tool. So there's two ways to do it. So if I start looking at the loops that had issues now, um, there's a scoping window that comes up and it lists all the variables and it tells me what scope they would be if, it, if we know. And if we don't know, it marks them as unresolved. And it puts the unresolved ones at the top, so you can find all of those first. And in this slide, you see just unresolved because there's a lot of variables in this loop and there are a lot of variables with issues. So a little bit about what we're showing here. So at the very top, there's a green bar, and this is again a slide 26. There's a green section of that says call or IO at line 55 of sweep x2.f90. And so what we're doing is we're pointing out if there's issues with calls where we can't see um, uh, below, uh, you know, where, where we may have issues uh, analyzing variables below that point. So if there's if there's an MPI call, for example, there's nothing we can do. We can't inline that. We can't do anything about it. We'll tell you that, and actually we'll stop our analysis, and then we won't have information about those about that loop. Um, so it will say that it failed. In this window here, you see the variables are on the left hand side under the name column. And there's a variable name, and then for some of them, there's an at sign and what is a function name. So what we tried to do recently as another enhancement to reveal is we tried to list the variable name and what function they came from if that variable lives in a function within your loop. So let's say I have that do j loop and I've got the call to PPMLR. What I've got here now is this particular variable came from down that call chain. And we also tag that with a letter i to say it came from inlining. And it, it lives in function parabola. So you can go find that variable and look at it and understand what's going on. Um, we do mark what's, what we found to be an issue with why we couldn't scope that variable for creating an OpenMP directive. And in this case, we have a flag that says we have a possible recurrence involving the object. Um, so basically, we're giving you some feedback about why something couldn't be scoped. We're telling you where it lives. And then we're trying to take care of all the variables that we could for you so that you have a smaller set to work with or that you have to deal with. Another thing that we will call out for you when we're scoping is if we've detected a reduction. And, a, and in this case, you have an R on slide 27. You have an R and an I. So for SVEL, what I have here is I have a reduction down the call chain. So it's in a subroutine or a routine that's called in my loop, and I have a shared reduction. Uh, you can see the scope was marked as shared, but there is an issue here. And so there's a warning mark that says that um, this, something has to be done with this if I want to leave this as a shared variable. 
So before, remember I mentioned that Ryman was the one clean loop, so I'm going to show you how to generate a directive for that, but then I'll also show you what you can do with the loops that aren't ready to be turned into official directives yet. So in the picture or in the window where you have all your scoping information with your variables and whether they're scoped as shared or private and whether they're arrays or scalars, there's two buttons at the bottom. One is a show directive and one is an insert directive. If I click on the show directive, what it does is reveal builds an example directive for that loop. In this case, because it's green, it would be okay to insert in your code and it should run correctly. Um, and the, what you can do in this, this, when the directive is built is you can do copy directive, you can click on that, and then it'll go in your cut buffer. So if you want to go and add it to your source code, you can. We also have the insert directive button, and what that does is that inserts the directive into the viewable source code in reveal. It doesn't insert it into the final source code, into your source code, but it inserts it into the viewable source code within reveal so that you can add your directive and then you can move on to the next loop if you want. So you can do more than one directive at a time. Oops, I went too far. Now I gotta go back here. Sorry about that. Okay, so that was slide 28. So now moving to 29, if I had Ryman at 63 and I want, that was a good directive, remember, um, and I want to add it to my source code for real, when I quit the tool, when I exit out of the tool, uh, um, there's a window that pops up asking if you want to save your changes. And save your changes means that they will save them to your source code and there's a little banner there that says it'll require recompilation if you want to continue to use reveal you're changing your source code. And uh, the user can choose, by default there are no, no source code changes made, but the user can choose to check this and then what we will do is insert that directive into your source code for you. We also have a flag or a menu item that says insert all valid directives. So there's a bulk insert that you can do. It's on, off of, I think, the edit uh, menu in reveal. And so if you have 10 good loops, 10 green loops, you could click on that and insert all 10 directives in one shot for you and then insert them into your source code. Um, if you have a loop that has issues, uh, this so reveal is not designed to solve the restructuring problems. It's not going to rewrite your code for you. The only thing it knows how to do is analyze your code and insert simple directives. And those directives are there for you to review. Um, and it's still up to the user to do the restructuring. So if there is some restructuring that needs to happen, um, you can insert a directive as is with issues. And what we will do is we will put it, an illegal OpenMP clause in, we've named it unresolved, and list those variables. So now what you can do is you can take this directive and exit reveal and go to your favorite editor and start working on the code. But you can use this as a template, kind of like as notes, to be able to know which variables you have to go after. So um, we do allow you to add these directives, but it won't compile because it's designed to be a working copy of a directive that you're going to modify as you restructure your code. All right. Um, a couple of example slides here, and then um, let's see. I have I have a couple of examples of the types of things that you would need to do for for this code in particular. The types of things that you would need to do to restructure your code. So one of the things is if you have global variables, for example, in a Fortran 90 module file, and um, dvol was one of them that was flagged in here in the scoping results. Um, you need to make them. In many cases, you need to make them thread private. Uh, so that they, so that the um, data is protected as you're using it in the loops. Another thing is, um, remember I had the shared reduction down the call chain. One of the things to do there is to put a critical section around that, so the shared reduction is protected from uh, multiple threads trying to do it at the same time. Um, I have a couple of examples here. You can take a simple on slide 32. You can take a simple just add an OpenMP critical region, um, or you can do something more sophisticated and do a restructuring where you keep that loop to a minimum that's within the critical section and you pull some things out. So just a couple examples of what you can do, what the user is responsible for doing, that the tool will point out uh, where there's issues, but the user still has to do this. Another thing that we added is we added the ability, let's say I already have OpenMP directives in my code, 
but now I want to, I, I'm getting wrong answers. So I added this open OpenMP all by myself. I didn't use Reveal, and I'm getting wrong answers. One of the things that you can do is you can run Reveal and have it assess the OpenMP directive and see if it matches what it thinks it should be. And if it doesn't, it'll flag it. So there, the example is on slide 34 here. When I tried to scope the loop at line 69 here, um, you can see there's a variable n that I made shared that should really be private. So it comes out from reveal as being private and there's a warning that it doesn't match what's in the directive. And so it can kind of be used as a debugging tool for scoping. Um, one thing to note is we support parallel do. That's, we don't support every type of OpenMP directive. So it really is for the most common directive that we find, but, but um, it, it, is, it isn't uh, complete. You know, it doesn't check all your OpenMP constructs. The other thing that we added new that I wanted to point out is one of the things that we want users to do is parallelize outer loops first. Choose the outermost loop to try and parallelize so that you can then vectorize the innermost loop or maybe even add hyperthreading uh, capability, you know, level of parallelism at an inner loop. And so we use these triangles on the left hand side here. You can see there's green, but there's a little white triangle within at loop 70. And if you hover over that symbol, it'll tell you basically we scoped both of these loops, but one of them is an inner loop, so you probably don't want to do that. So the triangle is a caution sign. And um, it tells you you probably don't want to pick that first as your first choice for parallelism. So we're trying to guide you to parallelizing the outer loops. And again, if you don't remember what the symbol means, just hover over it when you're running the tool and it'll tell you what it means. So just a couple of things here I just wanted to mention. So we used uh, VH1 as an example here today. And it's written, VH1 is written with high-level loops with a lot of subroutine calls, and it's got pretty complex decision processes. And we added uh, OpenMP to it using Reveal. So Reveal, in this case, we were able to find there were some storage conflicts. We had you know, the shared reduction down the call chain. Um, we found variables in Fortran 90 modules, which needed to be made thread private. And um, basically what the tool is designed to do is to call out the tricky stuff about what's difficult about parallelizing a loop, and then do the easy parts for you so you don't have to worry about those parts. The things that are automatically or easy to scope as shared or private, um, you can take care of, or the tool will take care of those, and then you can focus on what's the most difficult. So with this code, um, we were able to, we've looked at this code and we've actually ported it using Reveal and we can do the scoping within a very short time compared to what users, the time it takes users traditionally to, to do this analysis. We also have another example, um, S3D. I have, a, I have a few examples, but I'm just talking about two of them here. S3D is another code. Um, and this was also used um, initially when we added OpenMP to S3D. We didn't have Reveal, and that was one of the reasons that we decided we needed a tool like this. And so it took several months, like six months, I think, to, to do the porting from pure MPI to MPI plus OpenMP. But then once Reveal was available, what we did is we ran Reveal on it, too, to see what it would have done and how long it would have take, taken. And um, we, we were successfully able to use Reveal, and it was very quick to get the similar type of information that the analyst had taken a long time to do. So it really does cut down the amount of time it takes to do that initial parallel analysis. Um, and then what we did with S3D is we created both an OpenMP and an OpenACC version. So one of the things we tell people if they do have accelerators is to go to OpenMP first, because you can run it on your x86, and then go to OpenACC because they're similar models. So that now you have a code that runs in multiple places. So finally here, um, the intent of Reveal is to not restructure your code for you. It's there to help you assess what you need to parallelize. Craypad is there to help tell you which loops to go after. And uh, Reveal does the easy parts. You know, it scopes the easy variables for you and helps build a directive with those. It, it'll insert the directive in your code so you don't have errors typing. Um, and then for the difficult parts that you need to restructure, um, then, then you have at least some information about what's, what went wrong or what you might need to do. 
So, so the tool is there to help you as you add more levels of parallelism. Again, it can help you with vectorization information from the compiler and with OpenMP. So one of the questions I get a lot is from Reveal, um, it only works with the Cray compiler and it only works with the Cray performance tool. Uh, and that's true, but what we did is we gave you a tool that ultimately will give you OpenMP directives that you insert in your source code. So once you've inserted the OpenMP directives in your source code, um, then you can take that application and you can build it with any compiler you want that supports OpenMP and, and run it. And so even though it's um, specific to Cray as a tool, you can think of CrayPat and the Cray compiler and Reveal as a tool, a porting tool, to get you to a version of your code that would be hopefully more performance portable across different compilers and across different systems. So you're not tied to a specific system either. So um, I did take a look at Edison. Uh, Edi on Edison, you're running PerfTools 6.2.0, and that should have all the capability that I showed in the slides today. And so, and it's quite current. We did release a 6.2.1 in September, but it doesn't have a lot of changes to Reveal anyway, so you are running a pretty current version of Reveal. We do have a release coming out in December again, a 6.2.2, so that's the next release of Reveal. But again, it would have only minor bug fixes and things. So, so um, <clears throat> for the rest of this year, you should be pretty set as far as the key functionality that's available in Reveal. Um, so with that, that is a, an overview, a lot of information. I'd like to see if anyone has any questions. I'd like to kind of um, leave the last 10 minutes here for questions and also if you have any feedback because we also love to hear if there's anything that we're not doing that you think would be very valuable because we do get a lot of our feature requests from direct users and we try and implement what, what we can. So. Thank you very much, um, Heidi. So I, I yeah, I'm clear that you, although it only applies to um, Cray compilers, um, it's a tool that you can um, use it under Cray compiler, verify correctness of OpenMP, and, and port it to other compilers as, as your choice. And Edison and Hopper both have um, the current uh, version uh, uh, released in, in June, I think. So um, I, I, there's a lot of, of improvement over previous um, versions that I, I remember. Yes, like, we've, uh, yeah, we we can only choose um, we can, there's like a, it's a user's choice, and there's to, to choose which loop to uh, scope. Now it's the, the real tool guides us which are the best what, what, which to, to, uh, loops are better to, to scope first. Things like that. Yep. Um, yep. We're trying to add some more. Um, to, to help direct the user, so we did uh, we did a good round of features to do that to help direct the user um, since you know over this last year, and we will continue to do that too. The other thing we're adding improvements to um, our C support. So we support Fortran the best. Uh, we do support C and C++, but because of the difficulties of those language languages and parallelizing loops with those languages because of pointers and ambiguity. Um, we didn't support it as well, but we have added a lot of things that you'll see coming through the Cray compiler and reveal that will support more C codes and more C++ too. So, so, so um, one one question basically: um, there are more complicated OpenMP uh, structures are not supported, such as task or, or yep, D or even nested OpenMP or um, they. Um, Reduction class uh -huh. are not supported, right? Right. So the goal of the tool was to the goal of the tool was to help you identify which loops to go after to parallelize, and also to do a basic uh, so to do parallel analysis and point out where there's issues with um, dependencies with the loops, and then just do a basic OpenMP directive. If you want to do something more complicated, you're more than welcome to do that on your own as a user. You can take the OpenMP directive that we generated and then use it to build other directives. But we don't, in reveal, at least at this time, we don't plan to support the full extent of directives of OpenMP because we wanted to spend most of the time with the dependence analysis and the you know helping guide you to which areas of your code you wanna you wanna tune. 
So that's left to the user, the other okay. type of directive. Right. So if you don't have open MP yet, this is a great, great start point, and and, and then it gives you all the guidance to resolve. Um, right. Things you need to resolve your right. and understand your code and. Um, yeah. And yeah, and we're also we're, we're also trying to turn so the messages and the information you get about issues with scoping variables sometimes can be um, compiler developer centric. So they don't really it doesn't make sense to a typical user what the, what we're trying to say, and we're trying to clean that up too so that they're more meaningful. So instead of saying there may be a possible recurrence, for example, we may say. Uh, you have a global variable that's in a module. You can make thread private. You know, something to tell to directly tell the user what to do. So those are the ne next type of things that we're going after is more directing the user on what they can do. There's a lot more information on the the, the messages you provide than the previous yep. version. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, the one thing I want to just caution uh, caution users um, also maybe a feedback. <laughs> That when you start to have the suggested uh, loops as uh, OpenMP directives, and you said you want to save in your code, it overrides your original code. Yes. So maybe you can try to save a new version or try to uh, save your original code first. Maybe give a warning to users, or maybe save the new version a new as a new name. If yeah. Yeah, we did. So in the banner that's pulled up when we save your code, we tell you that it's going to overwrite the the source code. And we didn't do any complex renaming or backup files because the program library is involved and needs to know the name of the files. So if you want, so, so it's an option. First of all, the default is to not touch your source code. But if you do want to make changes to your source code and you need to save a copy of the previous version, you can do so ahead of time. The other thing is the only thing that reveal does to your code, and, and I keep saying this is what I try and I want to preserve this, but I can't promise this for the future. The only thing that reveal does is insert directives. And the directives have a comment in front of them that say directive inserted by reveal. So even if you did change your source code, if reveal did write to it, the only thing is directives, and you can easily grep for them by looking for reveal, the word reveal with a capital R, and you can just take them out again if you wanted. So we did, you know, we, we, we toyed with making the tool more complicated by having some sort of source control and backup plan, but because we're just inserting directives and because we warn the user that we're going to do this and because we don't do it by default, we just decided this path. So. When you this, it's going to overwrite your file. I don't remember to see that. Yeah, in that in that window that you where where you exit the tool, the window that comes up and asks you if you want to write it to your file, it tells you that. Yeah, it's going to overwrite. I yep. want to pay money for that. Yep. So you have to read it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that that is the case. So. And you have to do something for it. To, when you quit the tool, you have to actually click. You have to ch put a check mark in the box for it to do it. If you just quit the tool, it's not going to touch your source code. So you have to actively request it to write to your source code. Make sense? Yeah. Anybody else have questions on the line? Yeah, we, we don't we don't have um, questions um, through the web webex chat room. So okay, I just ask if there are no questions. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Heidi. And okay. Thank you for joining us today. All right. The, the slides and the audio will be um, audio file will be available on on, on the website. The slides is already there. So we'll put the web as uh, audio because but because um, Heidi is remote, so we don't know the the quality of audio yet. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks again. Thanks, Heidi. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.